Hi, everyone. Welcome to our discussion today, how culture wars have derailed school board meetings across the country. I'm Mara Shalop. I'm an editor here at ProPublica and your host today. Um, we're going to get started in just a few minutes. We're waiting on more people to sign in. We're at a hearty 220, 233. Um, but thank you so much for your patience. Uh, a few little Reminders, uh, closed captioning of the program is available. You can enable it by clicking on the closed caption option bar that's toward the bottom of your screen. Um, again, today we'll be discussing disputes that have led to uh, unrest and arrests at school board meetings across the country. Uh, it looks like we are climbing well over 300. Thank you guys for being here. Um, so we'll go ahead and formally get started. Uh, I'll, have, I'll repeat myself for just a moment. Uh, again, if you're just joining, my name is Mara Shalop. I'm an editor at ProPublica. I'm your host today. Uh, welcome to our discussion, how culture wars have derailed school board meetings across the country. Uh, again, closed captioning of the program is available. Turn it on by clicking on the closed caption option on the bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, as an additional note, this session is being recorded. Uh, a link to the video will be emailed to everyone who registered. So thank you for doing that. Um, for those of you who are new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism, uh, or as we say around here, journalism with moral force. You can find a link to our school board coverage uh, by Nicole Carr in the chat. Um, today we'll be speaking not just with Carr, but with experts uh, about unrest that they too have are familiar with at school board meetings across the country. Uh, and those that unrest stems from a number of things. It could be free speech, library book bans, transgender rights, teachings about race. Um, our reporting in our school board series zooms in on specific cities and counties uh, to provide a deeper understanding um, of the impact on school board members, on parents, students, and communities at large. Uh, but for today's discussion, we invited experts to share their knowledge and shed light on some of the larger themes identified in this series. Uh, our hope here is to provide a bird's eye view of the reporting and to talk about the impact of this discourse on policy, culture, and democracy itself. Uh, but to begin our conversation, I'd like to invite uh, my colleague, ProPublica reporter Nicole Carr, to join us on screen. Hi, Nicole. Thanks for being here. Uh, Nicole's reporting uh, broadly focuses on criminal justice and uh, racial inequity for ProPublica's South Unit, uh, though this reporting has taken her all over the country, I should say. And um, yeah, let's let's get into it. So. Uh, for those who haven't read all of your work on this topic or even any of your work on this topic, can you share a brief overview of just what you found? Sure. So our, our main interest coming out of some reporting that dealt with uh, the anti-CRT movement last year uh, was, you know, kind of tracking the unrest in a, in a way that would help us track other themes. Uh, tied to the unrest. So uh, myself and research reporter Molly Simon uh, started crafting a database that um, that tracked folks who had been arrested and charged in the school board meeting space. And um, from there, we added other incidents of of unrest and and saw. Um, patterns with people um, in, in the outcome of that unrest. And that's really what the reporting is about. Like, what, what is the sum of, of the unrest and who is at the center of it? Um, and so if you read our overview, which is a, a multimedia interactive that we published last week that ties these narratives together in different states, uh, we looked at uh, about 90 incidents in 30 states. That was the first thing that stood out to me um, was that we were going coast to coast, north to south. There was no rhyme or reason to the geographic area of the unrest. And we could kind of anecdotally say that. I'm sure everyone who is um, listening and joining us today, and thank you for join joining us uh, this afternoon, 
I'm sure we can say, oh, I've seen this viral moment at a school board meeting, or I've, I've seen this kind of everywhere and scattered. But by the data, we could tell that it was across the country. Um, we were looking at this 18 month period from the spring of 2021. That is really when these school board um, meetings were back in person and, and out of that virtual space when people were coming to the space. And uh, from May of 2021 to November of 2022, and we saw the most common charges associated with this. This was trespassing, trespassing, resisting arrest, um, uh, disrupting a public meeting, misdemeanor charges. Uh, for the most part, we had assaults, we had threats, but in most cases, prosecutors decided this was that worth, you know pursuing. Uh, most of the charges were dropped against people and, and uh, nearly every person, I'm saying except for one, who was at the center of this unrest in our database was white. And I think it's important to identify uh, all of the the components of, of what we found uh, to understand who is driving uh, the unrest, the complaints, the narrative, and then what is the outcome of that? And so that's where it leads us. And that's where we go with the narratives. Can you just describe what you mean by unrest a little bit? Like what meets the threshold of unrest? Because some of y'all, some of us have been to school board meetings and they can be pretty tame or they can be somewhat spirited it's, and people get passionate. But like what constitutes unrest journalistically that made you, um, that lit you up in terms of this being important? Right. This is a great conversation that we had. You, you as my editor and working through this and saying what, what counts as, as unrest. And it's, it's not just uh, yelling something or being passionate from a podium. This was um, it, taking over meetings. We had an incident in Utah where uh, 11 people had declared they are the new school board. So it's taking over the meeting. Um, it's it's the uh, physical interaction with others, um, you know, both during the meeting and after the meeting. We had an incident that we examined uh, in Arkansas in the parking lot of a school board meeting where a gentleman uh, admitted to police later on that he had he had uh, pushed this woman into a parked car because he was so frustrated coming out of the meeting where they were talking about the content of library books. I mean, there was quite a, a, a threshold for that. It was the, the chaos, the the having to separate people, uh, oftentimes school board members receiving uh, police escorts to their cars after the meeting. Um, you know, that sort of thing. It, it So it definitely is not about free speech and just expressing and being passionate about your children or your community's children or an idea that you have about what should or should not be taught in schools. It was actually like bringing the thing to a, to a halt and, and people, um, real consequences in people's lives when they walk away from the school board meeting. And what made you interested in reporting on school boards to begin with, like this isn't something you'd covered for years and years. Like, what brought you into that at this mm -hmm. point in time? Yeah. So, for me, it, it goes back to a piece that we published last year uh, at ProPublica about a, a black a DEI educator, a woman, an accomplished black educator who had been hired for a DEI role here in Georgia. And, and DEI, uh, for those who don't speak in these acronyms, <laughs> means what? Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we found it was a job that she had not applied for, rather she had been, uh, you know, encouraged to apply after uh, she was relocating to this district uh, north of Atlanta. And anyhow, there is a, a scene in that story that leads her to quitting the job before she starts. And it's at the school board meeting. And it's a scene where we see the folks, it was the first time I'd seen uh, the, the moms or the women wearing the I don't co-parent with the government t-shirts. And there were, at the time, we were not associating that with the Moms for Liberty group, but we were, you know, checking out what people were saying about um, the CRT movement. And But there was chaos at that board meeting in a way where like people were banging on windows and protesting her hiring. There were prayer circles that were being formed in front of the school board um, 
uh, dais and the, the school board members themselves had to be um, set into a room behind the dais for protection and pulling kids into that room who were speaking at the school board meeting. It was just, it was wild. It was a wild scene. And I said, well, what happens after this? Like what happens in a community after this moment? Um, and so that kind of, that led us to start tracking it. Mm -hmm. And in talking to people who've witnessed this unrest or were involved in the, in the unrest actively, do you have a sense of why it happened at school board meetings? Like why, why the school board meeting? Um, in some cases, and, and that is going back to that prior reporting and also in talking to people in, in, in this space, um, you know, they were summoned there by like-minded people in different ways. So in the reporting last year, we saw where parents attended almost a training session and said, this is how you engage your school board. And this is how you get national attention. And that first story was like how to get a clip on um, Tucker Carlson or Fox News or how to amplify your message from the school board podium. This is what you do. So there's that organizational point. And that was done by conservative nonprofits that we attract um, last year, led us into this reporting. Um, in some cases it had been, I, my neighbor told me what they're doing and I decided to show up or it was in a church space or it was, you know, so this is really, a community pushing folks to the space. And then most of the people in our database were in fact, um, parents that I know that's a question that people had. We were trying to figure out, well, how many people are actually connected to the district, whether they stayed in the district or not is a different story. But at the time, at the point of unrest, we had found that most of the people did in fact have children in the system. And then you had folks who say, well, hey, I'm a, I'm a taxpayer, you know, public education, we all have a stake in public education and what happens in this space. And they say, yeah, I'm just, I'm just showing up. But for the, for the most part, it was, it was parents. It was parent led, white parent led unrest. Yeah. I mean, parents are, can be forgiven for being passionate about their children's education. This is a forum in which people do speak up about um, the, the most, you know, dear, the most dear to them thing in the world. Uh, so, I mean, I was not surprised that things got sort of heated there, but I was surprised by several things you turned up in your investigation. And I'm curious if you could talk about what surprised you as you were doing this reporting or what you felt would surprise readers. Oh, I'll go back to our first chapter in the series, which landed in Conway, Arkansas. And we were tracking uh, several different uh, people in, in that space, a retired teacher um, who had reported uh, what she believed to be a bullet hole through her living room window after the school board meeting. Um, another woman who was there uh, speaking up for LGBTQ students who uh, was pushed in the parking lot. And then there was a group of college students who saw a viral moment from the school board. And that's what made them show up. And uh, they were uh, pro, they were chanting trans, trans lives matter at a school board meeting and were arrested and eventually sentenced to jail. What surprised me in that reporting was how the policy that people were debating in that space or where the unrest had, had, had um, centered quickly became a uh, state law, meaning <laughs> the school board, the local level policy had, by the time we finished reporting this out, um, you know, over this, this past summer, like laws that began July 1 in Arkansas were very similar to the policies that the school boards had passed just like that. And so they were at this, you know, grassroots local level discourse. And now you have a bill signed into law that mirrors what happens at the school board. And so that that is of great interest to me, how quickly policies and, th and things morph into uh, uh, laws or, or things that, that really impact us on a wider level. 
Um, so that was, that was one of the things. And then I guess it shouldn't have surprised me, but I, I thought we might see a concentration of the unrest in certain parts of the country. And that was not the case. This is very much, uh, the United States in our unrest, <laughs> all of us. I mean, there's also it's worth mentioning that you were compiling and, and your research partner, Molly Simon, were compi compiling videos. A lot of this was either on the live school board feed or hit, there were lots of social videos and that you were watching lots and lots of videos from lots of different parts of the country um, in a sort of condensed period of time. like. What did you take away from that? And those videos, I should say, form the spine of a, a multimedia piece that came out last week. But you know, there's many more videos that are in that piece. And I'm curious what you made of that and what might have surprised you in that. That the districts themselves, the school board members themselves were not ready for what landed in that space, either by policy. And I've talked to one of our panelists who you, who you will hear from in a few minutes about uh, the the 1A argument, the free speech argument, and like how far you would have them, the school board members trying to shut a conversation down or shut the comments down as something got you know out of control in the space. And we've seen even a federal lawsuit here in Georgia in one district that we've reported on where um, the federal judge says, you know, they have a point when it comes to free speech, you can't stop them from doing this, this or that at the podium from saying these things. Um, but those things uh, were like a climactic moment in, in, in the larger unrest. And so the school board itself didn't know how to handle it from a uh, policy standpoint. Like, how do we keep control of this, but hear from people and not violate, you know, free speech? Because some, some of the incidents, it's easier to say, oh, what should be done? Like, oh, okay, you have folks who are, or someone who's eventually charged with assault, like you can't go into the school board meeting and put your hands on people. Like that's a cut and dry thing. But how do I uh, control this kind of um, fur that's building at the podium that leads to this other unrest without violating this person's rights and keeping control of the meeting and, and serving the larger public and the people who are at home and who are in this space. Like, how do we handle this in a policy uh, way? And, uh, and another one of our panelists will talk about this as well as she studies um, this space. And it's, it's really, you know, finally just a um, democracy space. So that's, that's why I said, you mentioned earlier, I didn't necessarily, I'm not an ad beat reporter or whatever, but I've always considered this reporting a democracy space. And so we should all, uh, we're all stakeholders and we should care what is happening here. Well, I'm excited to hear from the panelists who've been increasingly referencing the call. Let's, let's bring them on. So uh, I'd now like to introduce these experts uh, and invite them to join us on screen. Uh, I'm gonna run through their bios so y'all will um, be familiar with their work. Uh, Deborah Caldwell Stone is director of the American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom and executive director of the Freedom to Read Foundation. Uh, an attorney by training, uh, she is a former appellate litigator who works closely with librarians, library trustees, and educators on a wide range of intellectual freedom and privacy issues in libraries, including book censorship. Thanks for being here, Deborah. Thanks for uh, having us. It's a pleasure. Uh, Kevin Goldberg is the First Amendment specialist at the Freedom Forum, where he works to educate the public about the substance and importance of the First Amendment. Uh, prior to joining the Freedom Forum, uh, he served as Vice President Legal for the Digital Media Association and was a partner in two law firms where he focused on First Amendment FOIA, for those who don't know, that's Freedom of, in of Information Act requests, um, and intellectual property issues. Hi, Kevin. Hello, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Pleasure. Uh, Carrie Sampson. Hi, Carrie, is uh, an associate professor in the Division of Educational Leadership and Innovation at Arizona State University. Uh, her scholarship explores how educational leadership and policymaking at the K through 12 level 
influence equity and social justice for minority communities. Uh, Dr. Sampson's research is centered at the school district level uh, and has an emphasis on governance, particularly the role of school boards, uh, community advocacy, decentralization, and school choice policies. So what a stellar group of people. I'm so excited for you guys to be here. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with one question, but Nicole's going to do most of the questioning. Uh, but my first question is um, this, that Nicole has just described her perspective as a journalist when it comes to unrest at school board meetings. I'd like to know uh, what has stood out to each of you in terms of this unrest that she has identified, but I'm sure you have too, over the past two years. Um, and then what has it meant for your work? So uh, I'm just gonna start with Deborah and then uh, but Deborah to uh, pick on the next person. Uh, I guess what struck me most about what's been happening at school board meetings is the vitriol that's been directed at librarians and educators um, who are simply there to teach, to serve the students and the families in that school district. Um, we get reports almost daily now from librarians who are being attacked uh, who for simply providing books to students uh, that a group doesn't agree with. Um, and it's changed our work. We've had to add staff. We provide support to school librarians and now public librarians as well. And we are dealing daily with providing support to librarians who are dealing with demands to censor books, as well as the personal attacks that go with those demands to remove books. Kevin, you wanna jump in? Sure, I, I think I would also agree that the vitriol is, is something new. There was, and I would say, I'll, I'll build on that a little bit. To me, and I'm, I'm an active watcher of public meetings, um, you know, and have been for years, both from, as you mentioned, the FOIA side, a corollary to FOIA is open meetings, but also First Amendment. Um, I would say the coordinated vitriol. So before it was very discreet, you had one parent with one issue and if anything, that parent was very much in the minority viewpoint, and maybe you'd have other parents that were sort of like, oh, just sit down, you know. It's, we've heard heard from you this, we've heard this from you so many times. And now it's the groundswell of people just with the same message that, as Deborah said, really puts the the career, and I would go so far as to say career experts on the defendants. I mean, I'm saying on the defense. Mm -hmm which is a Absolutely. difficult place to be and, and, and a dangerous place to be, I think, for if you look at it in the grand scheme of things, these are the people who we entrust with decision-making who have worked their lives to become experts in a field. And in a lot of senses, they're probably very close to saying, I just, I don't need this, you know? <laughs> this isn't what I signed up for. I believe in this, but I don't need this. And that that's a, a, a concern to me. Harry. Yeah, and I'll build on that. I think I was surprised at the way in which these issues are being conflated. Um, and, you know, we have COVID, CRT, anti-LGBTQ efforts, et cetera, um, kind of just all in this perfect storm um, that has created a very um, broad and, and strategic effort um, uh, uh, for folks and organizations to focus at the local level and at these school board spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and while it's you know surprising and shocking, it's also not surprising and shocking because it really reminds me of what Carol Anderson calls white rage, where she like pinpoints this history of uh, pushback against any you know equity or any kind of movement forward um, in terms of like racial justice, inequality, and social justice. And so you know you see these these groups um, of parents and non-parents. You know we have proud boys showing up at school board meetings, etc. Uh, very coordinated, and like Kevin said, um, fighting kind of for this this um, right to you know be free of mass mandates, to be free of exposure to certain curriculum, to be free of having bathrooms for transgender students and their same you know in the school you know with with their children, and so um, this kind of entitlement um, that is associated, I think, with this white rage that has happened for you know decades, centuries. Um, and so, yeah, but I think that the series really captured um, the ways in which, you know, some, a lot of these organizations, a lot of these parents are not being kind of 
held accountable. These dismiss these charges were dismissed for the most part, with the exception of one one group of students who were um, kind of advocating on the other end of the spectrum <laughs> around an anti LGBTQ policy. So, um, yeah, the, I mean, again, it's shocking, but not shocking. Uh, uh, thanks for that that overview and what we want to do from here uh, before we take in the audience questions is kind of talk amongst um, uh, you all in different categories of of uh, the unrest and what we've seen. And so we're going to start in the book banning space. And Deborah, you you sort of uh, touched on this a moment ago when you said that you all are providing the guidance and support to librarians who are facing harassment and who have been targeted in, in these movements. And my first question was really about how the ALA engages both school librarians and public librarians amid uh, this controversy. And uh, we, we talked about new laws in Arkansas that, you know, they, mm -hmm. they, uh, public librarians could face a felony for providing obscene material to the, um, a minor. So like you're working in two different spaces. How, how do you, how do you talk to these librarians and what are you saying right now? Well, we've been providing support to library professionals for decades. Um, and what we generally do for them is help guide them through the process of dealing with the demand to remove a book from uh, a library shelf, um, go over their policies, give them legal information. There is court precedent about removing books from publicly funded libraries, both school and public, um, and generally try to equip them with the information they need to provide information to their board members, to the parents or individuals bringing the challenges. And, and to generally guide them on how to resist censorship. It's a paradigm of the profession to support the freedom to read, to resist censorship, to provide broad access to all kinds of information ideas in support of the public good. Um, what has happened more recently is we're now dealing with librarians who are being targeted with threats and um, stigmatization, uh, demands that uh, they leave the community, and how to guide them through dealing through this hateful speech, this hateful conduct that's being directed at them. And it's not just librarians anymore. We also engage with uh, members of the public who are looking for ways and means to defend the freedom to read in their communities and in their schools. Uh, we also work with library and school board trustees who themselves are finding themselves under attack and are looking for uh, strategies to deal with this. And so we're, we provide policy information, legal information, um, sometimes just a shoulder uh, and an ear to listen um, when it becomes too stressful for them. So you had you had answered my next question about engaging uh, folks outside of that that role of uh, public librarians, um, but also the the general public too, and just educating because um, another thing that we know from the reporting, like there's really nothing new under the sun. Like book uh, challenge committees, people who review challenges, those have been around for decades. Challenging certain books have been around for a long time. And so for anyone here on the panel, like can you talk about uh, the, the, the library book landscape and this, this um, challenging what should be in the classroom or in the library on the shelves themselves like we've we've been here before yeah i mean we've always had disputes primarily about what books are available to young people um students um adolescents um and but what we've seen a real change since about 2015 is a real focus on challenging, removing books that deal with the lives and experiences of marginalized groups, LGBTQIA persons, uh, Black persons, persons of color, Indigenous persons. Those have become the books that are the real target. Um, we still see the occasional coming of age novel by John Green. Um, Toni Morrison's books, as challenging as they are uh, around race and slavery and our history with all that, are also on our books. Uh, uh, on our list of most challenged books. 
Uh, but generally what we're seeing is this real targeting of books that deal with LGBTQ themes. And then sometimes it's not just, they'll, they'll, we'll hear uh, an excuse. Well, it's about the, bo the books deal with sexuality, they're pornographic. But in fact, we're now hearing uh, in writing, in complaints about books, we don't want any LGBT books in our library, period. And that's in public libraries, not just school libraries. And that's a real sea change. And really what we're seeing, uh, another change that we're seeing is that this is coming from organized groups. Um, it used to be our challenge reports were always involving a single parent challenging one, maybe two books in the library. More than 90% of our challenges reported to our office last year involved multiple titles, and 40% of the challenges reported to our office last year invite, uh, um, uh, involved a demand to remove more than 100 titles at one time. This is not a parent raising a concern about a book for their student. This is organized political activity targeting categories of books for censorship. I want to add to that point, like as we're talking about policies morphing into state legislation, you and I talked about this earlier in the week, but here in Georgia, there is now a state law that says uh, you have to be a guardian uh, in the district or a parent or guardian to challenge the book, but then it puts the onus of the challenge on the uh, school principal <laughs> to go through yes, it versus the the book, the the committee that is normally comprised of, you know, the experts in this space who can look through um, standards and, and all of that. So uh, another example in our, our reporting of a, a, a flashpoint that is now reflected in, in state law, in state law with how we, we navigate things. Um, I, I want to kind of move into the actual meeting um, space and just starting with Kevin. And again, anyone jump in when when you want to. But we talk a lot about free speech. Like I should be able to go here and say what I want to say and and how I want to say it. And we we had some incidents in our reporting where like law enforcement didn't consider what most people would consider a threat a threat by legal standards they said that this doesn't meet um this doesn't meet that standard but what should school boards be doing to craft legally sound public comment uh periods without violating free speech but also trying to keep this kind of decorum in place like how do you how do you navigate that uh yeah it's 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 hard uh uh but it but it shouldn't be because the law surrounding free speech in public meetings really hasn't changed much. You use the term, and I, I may have the exact term wrong, but I like the comparison, so I'm going to use the term microcosm of democracy. And that's what these public meetings are. They're actually what we would call public forums, either designated public forums or limited purpose public forums. And these are these are legal terms that were created well outside of the, the school board meeting. Uh, you know, area, the public meeting area, and really apply to public spaces. And, you know, they are areas which the government has either traditionally completely allowed for public speech, places like the National Mall here in Washington, D.C., where everybody comes to protest, and you know that is a place, you know, the town square in, in any, you know, in any one of your cities or towns. These are traditional public forums, and people go there and, and speak. And then there's other things called designated public forums, where the government owns a space and then says, you can use this for free speech activities on a regular basis. And there are limited public forums. And these are places where the government says, you can come in and talk about this topic. And they each have different rules applied to them. And when you then layer those concepts into a public meeting, th then you, you just sort of apply those rules in a public meeting space. So it's not hard or shouldn't be hard to understand. And yet they keep applying. <laughs> You know, the school boards keep applying this wrong. So what I would say is they need not, they, they may not need better policies. They need better training to figure it out, especially, and I think part of the problem is again, in the heat of the moment, it does become very hard for people to apply these rules. And I get that. And, and I'll give you a, a sports analogy to, to, you know, one thing athletes do is they practice, they practice and they practice and they practice and they train and they train and they train so that when the crucial moment of a game comes, they are ready for it. And we don't necessarily see that from school boards. 
They need to, I think, undergo a little more training around the First Amendment to better understand these rules that have existed forever and apply them, you know, as a perhaps a second hand nature. So what are the boundaries? And I think someone has already yeah. dropped this into our, our chat. Like, what, what, what is that line between I can say what I want and I can make you feel like someone said in a, a post to a school board president we reported on, you know, encouraging you to sleep with one eye open? Like, what, yeah. what's the boundary? Well, um, so again, I, I talked about public forums and most of these meetings generally are designated public forums. You could talk about whether they're designated public forums, which you know, are places that we expect free speech and, and broad conversation to happen or limited purpose public forums, which are um, a little narrower and the rules are slightly different. In a designated public forum, basically the government can only shut down speech based on the message or the content if the government, you know, someone from the government can show that, uh, and, and they bear the burden, that there's a compelling interest for doing so, and that the means employed, the, the either the policy writ large, or the moment where you are telling someone, you know, stop right now, is narrowly tailored to advance that interest. So you, you may have a perceived harm, you may have some you know, somebody is going completely off topic. That would be one example. And you may say, okay, we need to bring you back on topic. And that person's going to say, you can't stop me from saying what I want to say. Well, the school board probably could in that instance, politely redirect the person or say your time is up. What they couldn't do is say, you can't, you know, we're going to redirect this person who's gone off topic into this area, but not redirect someone who goes off topic into this area, because you have to always be viewpoint neutral in that. And that's really what happens even in a limit, limited purpose public forum situation where you have to be viewpoint neutral. Now let's apply that to the situation you've talked about with threats, um, you know, threatening speech. There's a broad protection for freedom of speech. There are some categories of speech that are exempt from the First Amendment and you've hit on one, a true threat. A case that was actually just decided by the Supreme Court this past year talked about true threats and sort of redefined what true threats are, but generally speaking, they are statements made that are intended to put, you know, make another person feel the, the subject of the recipient of that statement, feel as though they are in some form of direct or perhaps even imminent harm. Uh, another would be the incitement to imminent, imminent lawless violence is another one. And fighting words is a third that comes into play in these kind of public meeting spaces. Defamation might be another, but really, and obscenity, I suppose, but really we're talking in, in the context of your question about people who are saying things that are really trying to provoke some kind of violent response, either from the other people on their side or from the person they're speaking to, which would be fighting words, or to make that person cower out, cower down in fear. Um, and those are, those are completely exempt from the First Amendment. You don't even have to apply that strict scrutiny framework I just talked about. If somebody were to issue something that narrowly qualifies as a true threat, yes, they could be punished for that, criminally punished even. Yeah, Gary, you and I had talked about this because you reviewed some of these videos in our, our reporting um, as well. And you were saying, you know, school boards have to figure out this policy that allows for uh, the people who want to speak to speak, to get their point across, but also try to figure out how to um, control the space in a way that that allows for um, for productive discourse so you can get on to the next, so you can hear all of these things. So can you, can you speak to that from a policy standpoint and just uh, from what the school boards themselves have to do to accomplish this? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I've, I've thought a lot about this because I do, you know, believe that democracy and education is, is important. I, I feel that school board meetings are a, a critical space where we see that and I've studied um, particularly minoritized communities who are you know, really advocating for equity oriented policies in school board meetings. So black mothers, Latin, Latinx mothers, um, and these spaces are really important for, for them to kind of you know, strategize and, and you know, offer their, their you know, uh, perspective and push kind of policy in equity oriented ways. Um, and I think though, you know, it's important to emphasize that the broader strategies that these current organizations are using, um, especially when you're talking about some of these militia-based organizations that are involved in it, are very anti-democratic. Um, they're kind of using strategies to imitate, or, and, 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 
intimidate, threaten, coerce school board members into changing policies and practices that can really kind of harm uh, children and families. And so I think um, as Kevin's talking about the distinguishment between what's free speech and what is violent, <laughs> Um, I think that's important to, to, you know, for school board members to understand and have, you know, again, you know, what you said about having training. And I think it's also important to remember that most of these school board members are volunteers. I mean, they're not getting compensated for their time. Um, they get into the position and they don't usually have a whole lot of training, um, you know, a lot of, you know, context, a lot of public, you know, or a lot of professional development. And so, you know, I think that we need to step back and think about how do we provide support um, in these environments uh, for school board members to kind of facilitate and handle uh, these conversations so that, yeah, we don't shut them off because they're very important. I think they're very important for all sides of the issues, right? Um, but when it gets to a point of violence, um, again, that's, that's anti-democratic. Yeah, and I, I want to, and because I know we have a lot of audience questions to get to, and, and a lot of them will be for you all. So just as a, a, a final um, question for everyone here, what do these existing protests and conflicts mean for the classroom, the, the, the libraries? Is this distracting from um, things that are uh, even more important uh, for us to be focused on right now? Or is this the thing of the moment? I think this encompasses so much. This leads to, to policy change, to curricula change, to all of that, but, and it's all important, but where does this lead us? Yeah. I mean, I'll say that, you know, in the, in the districts that I've been studying um, across the country, a lot of urban districts are not, I mean, these issues are kind of nearly non-existent in some of the urban areas that are serving majority students of color. I do see this more in some of these suburban rural areas. Um, and some of the things I've seen is that districts have pulled back their equity efforts that they had you know, recently rolled out um, or they've defunded some equity departments or they revised their equity statements to make them much more watered down versions, um, taking out you know, language around race or LGBTQ, um, and at the classroom level, that might be mean less resources and efforts to recruit, for instance, educators of color um, who are who are really known um, and you know evidence based uh, work around the fact that these these folks are critical um, in you know creating inclusive environments for our minoritized students and families. Um, this will likely mean less culturally relevant curriculum um, in schools, which research again shows are, you know, have been academically and emotionally beneficial for not only students of color, but for white students. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, like you mentioned, I think it's also just derailing um, conversations, you know, in terms of just advancing and kind of even coming out of COVID. Like, you know, now, now school districts and school boards are kind of having to deal with this whole nother, you know, like, um, set of issues that, you know, as they're also trying to, you know, transition our students back into schools and, and get them, you know, um, up to par in terms of literacy and emotional, socio-emotional learning, et cetera. And those are the things that are directly being attacked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what we're seeing is an absolute silencing of certain voices. Um, just, uh, we, and we hear from, the students themselves, that it's so important to find stories that reflect their lives, their experiences, their concerns on library shelves. And those books are being attacked and removed. And not only at the local level, um, uh, at, Nicole, as you've mentioned, we're seeing state legislation, the Arkansas uh, bill, which is, by the way, being challenged in court right now. F, uh, Freedom to Read Foundation is one of the plaintiffs in that lawsuit. Um, but also bills that uh, are intended to silence voices almost uh, nationally. I think of Texas HB 900, which is going to impose duties on publishers, uh, vendors of books, booksellers to rate books based on um, uh, you know, a very vague content, uh, sexual content standard that may well bleed over to every other state. Um, we're seeing a limiting of conversation, of ideas, really a limiting of uh, opportunities to learn about other lives, other experiences that many people encounter in the library. And it's a true loss. And I think it goes even further than that. I think it's an actual attack on the public good, uh, public education 
um, the foundation, the roots of our democracy um, by silencing voices, uh, limiting ideas, uh, engaging in a kind of indoctrination. So I'm going to provide a slightly contrarian, hopefully positive note. I am not um, a fan of book banning. I, I'm a book lover, always have been actually, and, and really believe that that the you know, a, availability of a wide variety of viewpoints, of, of diverse viewpoints, is not only essential for the learning process, but the fundamental underpinning of the First Amendment. I mean, if the First Amendment provides for anything, it is freedom, and it's our freedom to become who we want to be by, you know, making our own decisions, testing ourselves constantly. That said, there is one positive out of this, which is that people are finally, un, you know, finally engaging in petition and getting involved. And mm -hmm. we at the Freedom Forum have studied kind of American knowledge of the First Amendment and attitudes toward the First Amendment. Slight plug, we put out a survey on this just this week, our annual survey is called Where American Stands. And uh, one of the things we asked was, people are questioning how and what students are taught about race, sex, and gender in public schools. What level of input should each of the following groups have on what is taught in public schools? And the number one answer was that in terms of who should have significant impact, parents of school students, school teachers, and school students ranked top three in that order. At the mm -hmm. bottom were federal education administrators, state legislatures, state governors. So this proves that people want the decisions to be made by, you know, have based on input from people that are actually in the community and don't want them politicized. And so we're seeing that in practice now. I think that's a really good thing. I think the problem though is we're, we're seeing people that you know, engage in the right to petition. The problem is the people who are the strongest petitioners don't fully understand that the right peti to petition does not mean you always get your way. It just means you get to petition the government for the right, you know, for the right uh, to redress your grievances. And you know, that's where it stops, especially when other people are petitioning too. And we create Absolutely. this marketplace of ideas where people get their say, but they don't get their win all the time. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm all for getting people active, active in the local community. I agree though with Carrie and Deborah that the net result has been that those with the loudest voices are winning constantly, even if it's perhaps not the right answer, legally yeah. or, or fundamentally for our society. And I do just want to tag on to Kevin's comments that we've always supported the right to petition. It's part of the First Amendment. Libraries have had reconsideration policies for books for decades um, as part of their policies for dealing with concerns. But it's now been weaponized in a way that's targeting uh, particular ideas, particular groups. And we're all struggling to address that, especially when we have legislation that is actually accelerating uh, the removal of books from libraries rather than supporting their retention. We take on some of those uh, audience questions now here in our. I figured we'd give the panelists another minute, but we have so many coming in. So <laughs> yeah. before we turn to them, panelists, anything you wanted to add? There's a lot. So um, before we turn to that, anything we missed that you wanted to get in front of people? Okay. Um, just a couple seconds. Sorry, y'all. Okay. So uh, before we get to the Q&A, we're just going to really quickly post this link to our event survey. We love any feedback you can give us for how to do these events even better. Um, I also wanted to say that we've received well over 100 questions before this event even started from registrants, and thank you for that. We did select some of those, um, and those were ones that were repeatedly asked. Um, but for the most part, because we are hearing a lot of common themes come through, not just in among our great experts and Nicole, but also in the sort of questions that people uh, want answers to. So I'm also pulling some from the chat, uh, doing my best. Sorry for that noise. Uh, so um, we're going to launch right into these and anybody uh, jump in and answer. So uh, what independent oversight exists for these school boards? Is there any? That might be a carry question. I don't know. Um, what, 
I guess that would like, what would you mean by independent oversight in terms of, I mean, the state, they're really a creature of the state. I mean, so school mm -hmm. boards under, you know, state legislation and state law. Um, and we see, you know, different areas in which states can easily take over um, school districts and school boards altogether. And so, um, and, and whether, you know, uh, they're elected or, or appointed or hybrid, I mean, at the end of the day, if they are elected, I think that's some of the most, you know, the, the closest democratic link in which voters are then, you know, the, the ones who are mm -hmm. kind of we're seeing um, the school board and and do usually, I mean, there, there is a, a traditionally kind of a, a low voter turnout in a lot of districts. Um, I think this this uh, time and period has shifted that probably, um, but, um, and then you also have, you know, these instances of recalls, which, you know, again, in the last, you know, 18 months, you know, 24 months, we've seen a huge increase in recall efforts more than you know at any point in time probably um and so you know those that is also part of i guess these this idea of oversight um within the state law i tag on to that and remind everyone that publicly funded entities do have responsibilities to comply with the constitution and the bill of rights there are guardrails imposed by the first and 14th amendments, for example, not to engage in discrimination, not to engage in viewpoint discrimination or content discrimination. And school boards and library boards are bound by these rules as much as anyone, which, and, you know, there are those who would argue otherwise, but that those are, the, uh, ultimately we're seeing courts get involved. Um, we're even seeing the Department of Education get involved, their Office of Civil Rights, uh, US Department of Education, is receiving complaints that the removal of books dealing with race, gender identity, or sexual orientation are creating a hostile educational environment. And they're beginning to investigate and act on those complaints. There was a recent settlement in Georgia, Nicole, if you recall, uh, on those grounds that the school board had, uh, and their handling of the book challenges had created a hostile educational environment for the students in that school. Yeah, the lawyer in me was was going to, and specifically the First Amendment lawyer in me was going to remind everyone again of the right to petition, which includes filing lawsuits in the courts, and and yeah. that is a, that is a very big check quite often on on behavior, um, perhaps not to the satisfaction of everyone that it's not going far enough, but that is, as Deborah said, the usual way. One of these boards oversteps the line, and they, um, you know, they're they're set back. Another one would be, of course, not just that, that you go to the judicial branch, but um, the legislative branch as well. We've seen uh, Illinois and some other states, or can, Illinois in, in, in particular stands out to me as a, a state that in which the legislature has, I guess, passed an anti-book ban law, right? And maybe I can, you know, Deborah could flesh that yeah. out a little more and where that's happening. And that's a legislative response to, to some of these actions. Yeah, and, you know, it's a response to the fact that the courts move slowly, you know, we're looking at these lawsuits, but it could be months, years before we get an answer on the questions involved. Um, and I think that the Illinois legislation is reflective of that they wanted to address censorship in school libraries and now, or actually it's public libraries, I have to be accurate there, but what the law requires is the library has to adhere to the Library Bill of Rights, uh, which is really a statement of best practices and ethical standards for library service that abjures censorship and promotes wide access to ideas. Um, that's been part of our policies here at AOA for decades. Um, and they have to adopt that as part of the policy in order to get state funding. So it's less of a penalty for banning books than a requirement that they adhere to constitutional standards and uh, curating their book collections. There are other states that are considering similar bills. New Jersey is the primary one that I'm aware of right now, but we're seeing proposals come on other states uh, as well. And we'll see what crops up in the next legislative session in 2024. I realized that the, the person who submitted this question did not mean this, but in, in some way, the ultimate independent to oversight are the voters, right, who vote them into office. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious uh, how these school, bar, school board disputes are affecting school board elections. What are we seeing happen? Is there any oversight there? 
Well, I'm, I will tell you that we are aware of groups on both sides of the question targeting local elections in order to control you know, the school boards. Um, we're seeing this primarily from the conservative side of things. Uh, there's an organization called iVoter.org, which explicitly organized candidates with a conservative Christian viewpoint to get on school boards and library boards, other local entities to infuse that viewpoint into policy making in those communities. Um, uh, we've even responded in our own way. Uh, ALA now has an initiative called United Against Book Bans, which is intended to provide tools to individuals in communities that want to prevent censorship in their schools and in their public libraries, uh, to organize themselves, to speak out at board meetings, to provide questions to candidates to understand who they're voting for and what they stand for. We don't endorse candidates, of course, we can't do that, but we can provide tools to voters to know who they're voting for and so they can make a decision um, in line with their views. Yeah, you know, over the past two years, we've reported a lot on the slates of candidates, and this is on the conservative side, and and we've talked about endorsements. Um, you, you'll see in several pieces the endorsement of the 1776 Super PAC, or what, so you're seeing that organization in the, in, uh, the elections and people running as a single ticket, that's not possible, but, you know, running together, every, all of the campaign events are, are for a slate, and they're, they're, with the same ideas and they're going after these these seats in that way and someone had asked um earlier like do you think uh these nonpartisan boards just all of a sudden became political public education is inherently political but the organization in the way that people declare their politics or their ideology has certainly changed yeah and we've actually seen public school board, a public library board elections where they're nominally nonpartisan. And we've actually seen candidates hide their political affiliation in order to gain a seat. And then when they get on the board, they turn out to have a very conservative pro-censorship agenda. Um, that's happened in a number of communities, particularly uh, in the rural West. We talk a little bit about de-escalation methods that can or should be used at school board meetings and who's responsible for offering um, sort of effective conflict resolution training to the boards. We, we flicked at this a little bit in the conversation earlier, but um, do we know anybody who's doing this right? Like, what, what is y'all's sense of that? No, <laughs> I, I won't say, I won't pick anyone out who's doing it right or wrong. I will say that my biggest concern about the way the training will go from school boards is that, uh, or for school boards, is that they will get training from their lawyers, of course, from the school, you know, the, the, the district lawyers, um, the county lawyers, whatever body is they're a part of. And there's a certain self-interest to that, which is don't get yourselves in trouble. Um, and it, and it's, it's got a certain lens through it. It's not as First Amendment expansive as it could be, I think, in many in many areas. And yeah, I see a, uh, someone has put in the chat that the school board association provides training. But again, they're coming at it from a point of view. I would hope that they would allow outside, you know, First Amendment experts to to kind of weigh in and help out on that. Which is sometimes what has happened in other areas. I know you know, that, that you may have a First Amendment fight and part of the settlement is you will get training from an independent expert on this topic, um, which would be, a, you know, that's a bit of an extreme, but that's also something that, that happens and maybe should happen more voluntarily, perhaps, uh, and maybe conflict resolution as well. Again, you have people that are thrown into these conflicts that are now have been escalating for years and they're not prepared to handle them. Um, they don't get special training on that, which is, which is, I think, very important as well. Uh, that, that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Many state libraries and state library associations provide training to library trustees in particular, and we probably need to amplify those efforts um, and to provide trustees with the information, you know, the background, the information, the training they need to um, handle their duties and, and observe the fiduciary duty to serve the community as well. Uh, but I think um, we're learning all this um, in a foxhole kind of thing. Um, so 
Um, but we can certainly try to move forward for a future where that's it's handled in a better manner. I know that there's a number of nonprofits that do uh, deal with civic engagement, community conversations, and that I'm aware of a few of them getting active in some of the communities, but um, they're small and it doesn't address the larger trends that we're seeing right now. Yeah. I was also thinking, I mean, there are some school districts that do like some town hall meetings and, and things that are not, you know, official school board meetings. And I think those might offer a space um, that is less, you know, contentious or more um, open to, you know, actual dialogue, mm -hmm. back and forth dialogue. And I think some of the frustration is that, you know, during public comments, school boards usually aren't allowed to respond um, mm -hmm. to, to comments immediately, right? And so the, this can kind of create a very it's it's not a very not you know dialogical environment um where ideas can be you know discussed um and, and differences might be able to kind of be worked out and so i think maybe it's time for school more school boards to kind of consider how um how do you have these conversations beyond just the school board meeting that's being taped and and you know where social media is you know grasping <laughs> at the hands of that and so Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point, Carrie. I want to jump back in and say, you know, I, I realize this isn't always the case in some kind. Sometimes the First Amendment can be the pressure cooker of society, but I often refer to it as the valve on the pressure cooker of society in that most people just want to speak and be heard. They, you know, there are a lot of people that have an agenda, but there are also a lot of people that just want to say something. And when they deny that opportunity to be heard, they lash out in other ways. And, uh, you know, and maybe the, the, the town hall can be the valve on the pressure cooker of the valve of the pressure cooker that is the, the school board meeting and give people an opportunity in a different and, and better uh, environment to, to speak and be heard and, and, and listen, frankly. Mm -hmm. People are asking about several, this is coming up in several iterations, are time limits um, that are put on the public comments during school board meetings uh, denying free speech, as some are insisting. There's a similar question. Is it always permissible to announce and put on the agenda a time limit for speakers? So um, what do we think about that? It, it can be. Um, again, it, it often, as these things do, you know, as, as is the case, comes down to the actual execution of the time limit and applying it in a consistent, objective manner without regard mm -hmm. to the speaker. But time limits per se are probably constitutional. They are often unrelated to the content of the speech. They're what we we'll call content neutral. They fall into the range of, of our, you know, often referred to as time, play, time, place, manner restrictions on speech. They will incidentally burden somebody's ability to get their message across. If I want to speak uh, and I'm only given three minutes, that's very different than being given 10 minutes. It will have a burden on what I want to say. It will make me speak in a certain a certain way and, and recalibrate my, my words, but it's not directed at the content of my message. And so if, if, if that time, place, manner, in this instance, time restriction is applied to everybody equally, then it is, it is going to be consistent with the First Amendment, especially in these limited purpose public forums that I've talked about, where the, you know, the, the other requirement is that they simply be reasonable. Um, and viewpoint, so I said viewpoint neutral, but they also have to be reasonable. A 30 second time limit probably isn't reasonable. A three minute time limit, maybe a five minute time limit. You're getting better, of course. It can't be infinite, but, but, it, but you know, um, restrictions are, are, if they're reasonable, are going to be upheld consistent with the First Amendment. Yes. We generally see three minutes in what we yeah. do. Uh, that's why I was the first number I went to, I know. <laughs> I will tell you, I've sat through library board meetings that went on for almost five hours of public comment at three minutes each, <laughs> so. And, and, and in that sense, I would say, based on the record, the burden will be on the, the school board to justify the reasonableness. They would have a pretty argu good argument for a reasonable, for that being a reasonable cutoff period, because we cannot have these meetings going on until three in the morning every night, right? There has mm -hmm. to be a time limit. We've, you know, based on the record we've had, this is how these decisions are made. Based on the record we've had of previous meetings, this needs to be the, the limit. Not because we don't want to hear people speak, but because it has to be this way to actually do our business. Here's a provocative question, backing up a second. Why are parents given a platform to express these radically dangerous views and behaviors? 
I guess one man's radically dangerous views and behaviors is not every man's radically dangerous views or woman's yeah. uh, views and behaviors, behaviors, but, um, and there's a sort of similarity in this other question, I'll bundle them together. What is the current distinction between free speech and hate speech and how can boards maintain that boundary? So. Well, I guess this is a me question. It just, yeah, I, I was going to say, Kevin, why don't you start and I'll chime in. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, you know, the the the, the they're given these um, platforms to express radical viewpoints uh, for the reasons you you mentioned, uh, Mara, that um, one man's radical or woman's radical viewpoint is another's strongly held belief, and the First Amendment. And so the answer is because the First Amendment allows us to all express ourselves and create a marketplace of ideas where we listen to these, either have our own views changed or perhaps have our own views not changed and in fact reinforced. Uh, that is that is the grand theory and I know it gets tested all the time, but I still think it works. That being exposed to these, these radically different viewpoints can help reinforce what we actually believe in. Um, and so the second, the, what is the distinction between hate speech and and free speech, um, hate speech is protected by the First Amendment. Unlike many Western democracies in, in Europe, the United States does not criminally punish hate speech unless that hate speech falls into one of, the, one of those other low value categories. I'm expressing hateful rhetoric that is directed specifically at another person and therefore is a true threat. Or I'm expressing it face to face with someone in a way that is trying to provoke them into hitting me, which would be fighting words. Or I'm trying to rile up a crowd intentionally to go attack. You know, maybe maybe what I'm trying to do in that room is get people to physically attack the, um, you know, the school board members in some way or, or their opponents. Those would be areas where hate speech is no longer protected, but not because it's hate speech, but because it falls into one of those other low value categories. Carrie, this might be a good one for you. Is there a way to ensure that students' voices are heard during these debates? Have you have you looked at that at all? Um, I mean, youth definitely show up to school board meetings as well. Um, and and you know, kind of have, I think, in the last decade or so, especially really kind of used these spaces as well as a as a place to voice their their opinions. Um at the same time, I think, um, you know, whether they're actually valued in the same way as, as you know, parents and as voters uh, or potential voters is, is another question, right? Um, some school boards have, have um, appointed students to the school board. Um, I think that that's a good move to kind of get the, that youth representation on the board. The problem is that they often don't have voting power on the board and they just, you know, they're kind of just sitting there. Um, they might you know, say a few things, um, but they don't necessarily kind of shift the dynamic of, of policy and practices, um, depending, it, you know, it's dependent on the board and the district. Um, districts have also pulled together um, youth kind of committees to capture some of that youth voice. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's a lot more room for, for growth and, and how do we um, really pull in and embrace um, youth experiences and perspectives. I mean, I think across the board, we've, we've heard where, you know, maybe parents were really upset at the mask mandate, but the student themselves <laughs> were okay with wearing a mask. They didn't really care, but, you know, and so, you know, there's, I think, a difference in, in maybe opinions and, and experiences and perspectives from youth versus even their own parents. Um, I think that, that needs to get captured and, and um, valued a little bit more definitely in these spaces. Yeah, and there, there are organizations that are trying to empower youth voices. Um, and the National Coalition Against Censorship, for example, has the Kids' Right to Read project. We've seen other initiatives to try to empower youth. And, you know, I, I you reminded me of one other thing, Carrie, in talking about how sometimes these kids, you know, youth voices are not heard. They, we talk about parents' rights all the time, but we very seldom talk about the youth's rights. Youth have First Amendment rights particularly older minors. And we don't ever discuss the fact that we're taking away their own right to make their own choices about their reading. They're taking away the agency of young adults who are preparing to go to college, enter the military, start careers. You know, And uh, I think it's very dangerous for us to try to you know, teach lessons in censorship. 
um, uh, as we're doing right now and trying to pretend like they have no stake in this discussion at all. Uh, so, but uh, I think that's important to remember. Yeah, and can I add one more thing? One, one thing I've always thought about with these meetings is that, you know, while, you know, it's an open space, it's not necessarily open space for everyone. You know, you don't have like the single mom, at, you know, with all their, you know, trying to make dinner at night is not going to be able to attend a 6 p.m., um, mm -hmm you know, on a Tuesday evening. And so, you know, how do we create, and I, and I, you know, during COVID it was, when things went virtual, I thought, well, maybe this is a, a, an interesting place where more families can get engaged that maybe couldn't before, you know, that can show up to a board meeting um, and say some stuff. And so, you know, that I think has pretty much gone away um, and back to, back to normal, but um, you know, in terms of like, how do we broaden these spaces so that we're not just hearing the, the loudest voices or the the family, you know, the parents or the non-parents that, that show up to these board meetings. Um, some, you know, in some instances, some people are getting paid to show up to the board meetings. And so how do we, you know, counter that with a more, um, you know, equitable access to, to, you know, be able to, you know, engage school board members um, and school district officials um, for more families and, and youth. Nicole, here's one for you. Uh, how can journalists report on these topics while staying unbiased and neutral? You know, I, I don't think the facts ever fail, right? It's, it's So we don't go through these stories and say, we're going to just be fast and loose with what happened. They By the time you finish reading, walk away with what you walk away with. You know, that's it. It's It's... Um, the truth does not have to be comfortable and it's not, it's not, um, in a, in a way to approach the, the beat, what I've found and Mara, you and I were talking about this yesterday. Like I felt most comfortable when I was able to physically land in a space and talk to people and kind of navigate, which, which of course we do as, as local reporters, we're able to do that, but you should really understand, um, cause one of the first questions was how do people show up to the meetings? Like your reporting doesn't start with showing up to the meeting. It's like, what happened before the meeting and what drew people here and how do people, um, how have people been involved or engaged in the space prior to what I am seeing in these couple of hours? And that leads you to broader reporting and a better understanding of, of, um, the issue at hand and, and again, who's driving narratives and how and, and what, you know, in that reporting last year, when we had a, a recording of a clubhouse meeting that was doing a parental rights training kind of session, would not know that had I not engaged with someone through a FOIA request. And then said, that person said, hey, people met about this before this thing that you see in this viral moment. And like, how would I have known that? I'm not in the room, I'm not. <laughs> but it, it takes engaging people a little differently to understand those things and, and the facts will not um, fail you. What people think about the facts when they walk away from your work is on them. And that's why we put it out there in the public sphere the way we do. But you, you should not worry about what people take away from it. You are the record of the time and, and that's what, what we do. This question has come up a few times, we've referenced it a little bit, but not. I don't think we've answered this particular version of it. Do school boards simply have to listen or can school board members provide fact-based responses in the days that follow public comments that hinge on conspiracy theories or misinformation? I have seen school boards pull together, some school boards pull together, you know, school districts, you know, with school boards and superintendents pull together kind of um, responses in the form of maybe resolutions or, you know, kind of a newsletter uh, response. I've also seen some interesting, not very often, but like the ways in which um, school boards and superintendents use the media as well as a way to like respond to some of these issues. Um, you know, I, one of the studies I'm doing is an analysis of media and social media. And in a lot of cases, I've been, um, 
frustrated with, you know, the bias in some of the media and social media and the way that it politicizes these issues. But I also have seen, you know, like a superintendent was like, okay, I, I got, you know, he would, he was getting pushed out of the district um, by several parent organizations. Um, but he also, you know, had a heavy support by other organizations. And so he counted the number of emails he got. He said, you know, I got 200 and something emails. 75% of them were in support of me staying in this district. And he said this to a media outlet. And he's like, you know, this, this proves to me that I am wanted here. Like, here's what, why I made the you know, decision I made that, that these parents didn't like. Um, and he was able to kind of use that venue as a space to push back. Um, and he's still there in the district. Um, there's still a lot of tension, but um, I think they've been really strategic in how they've kind of you know, communicated to their district families, to their constituents, and to the broader public on these issues. So we only have time for like one more question, you guys. There's so many good questions still, and we're gonna think about ways we might try to answer them for people who've raised such thoughtful points. Um, I like this one as a last one. There's so many good options. Uh, this is simplistic, but why ban books you don't want your children to read? Why not let these books be available and just prevent your own children from reading them? I just don't get it. That's the question. <laughs> that's not me, that's the question. Um, it's what we agree with. We absolutely support the right of every parent to guide their students reading, you know, Librarians will work with parents and say, these are the books that match your values, your ideas, you know, um, but books are, you know, you know, but other books will be on the shelf and they're for other readers and we should just support, you know, the fact that they're there and, and support the fact that we have libraries that provide us that opportunity to read broadly um, and things. We should, you know, Kevin, you talked about safety valves uh having giving parents the right to guide their children reading but not to dictate other children's reading is really the solution here you know it's a safety valve for the first amendment it's a safety valve for student rights and parent rights i think that's what we need yeah i i agree i um you know i live in washington dc and and one of the counties just next to washington dc bordering washington dc montgomery county maryland is going through a a controversy regarding the inability of parents to opt out. So usually you have parents trying to opt their children out, which I think Deborah and I agree is the right answer. And in this instance, the, the question is whether parents who fundamentally disagree with an, uh, an inclusive curriculum and including, you know, and book choices are being prevented from opting their, their children out. And I don't think that should be the answer either. If a parent wants to opt their child out and it doesn't affect other children in the class, then that, that seems to me to be an appropriate answer, consistent mm -hmm. with the First Amendment. You are making your choices, you are speaking your minds, and you are not preventing others from, from living their First Amendment truth. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys, that's the time we have. It has been a pleasure being here with all of you. Thank you to the panelists for your time and expertise. Thank you to our audience for being here with us and for your extremely thoughtful questions. Um, this event has been recorded, so you'll receive an email with the full video of the event, and we will post the recording on ProPublica's YouTube channel. So to, um, if you want to share it with friends or want to revisit portions of this, please do check it out. Uh, there's also, we wanted to see if you guys have a moment to fill out our event survey. Uh, it's linked in the chat box. Again, we like to try to hear from you guys as to what we can do better. Um, and I just would encourage y'all to stay up to date on upcoming programs and discussions. Uh, our event page is uh, www.propublica.org slash events. We'll drop that link in the chat as well. Uh, but from all of us at ProPublica, thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time.